This is Investing Ideas by ValueInvestAsia.com. Hi guys, this week we talked to a dear friend of mine, Luo Wei. He's a private investor who has been investing in the market for 14 years. He started out investing similar as me in 2006, but he has a great run back in 2008 after the financial crisis where he made most of his investment gains. And after that, he has sold his own business and is now a full-time investor. Today, he's going to share with us his favorite stock at the moment, Berkshire Hathaway. It is a favorite among value investors, but Lowe has really understand the business and he's here to show us why Berkshire should be part of our portfolio. Here we go. From ValueInvestAsia.com, this is Investing Ideas, where we talk to investors from all walks of life, learn from them, and find out some of their favorite investment ideas. Hey, Lowe, how are you? Hey, Sandy, good to be here. Yes, hey, thank you so much you. for being on our Investing Ideas. And uh, you know, we try to talk to as a wide a range of investors uh, possible in this show so that to get a different view from a different type of investors, uh, both part-time and full-time investors. You yourself uh, has been a full-time investor for quite some time. Why don't you share a little bit about uh, when you first get started, how do you, would you describe your investment style at the beginning? So I got started into investing in um, right before uh, uni. I was in army and I was uh, thinking about how to be rich, how I think it's uh, possible to not work for a living. Uh -huh. And uh, I've got a good friend who introduced me to a book. He told me that, oh, you know, this guy invests and got 24% per annum. So I thought it was some MLM that he asked me to join. <laughs> and so I asked him, um, tell me more about it. And then after a while, he gave me the book. The book is The Intelligent Investor. So that's how I got my first book. But I didn't understand Intelligent Investor at first. So I started reading around the books, uh, all the books in the Chao Kang library. I was in army. So what I did was I started reading systematically from top rack to bottom rack from the Chao Kang library. Every week, I'll go through about four books. And after a while, I realized that, oh, value investing is something that really uh, talks to me. And, and I think I know a bit of things about it. Yeah, that's how I first got started. And then in SMU, I did an uh, accountancy degree. So then I've got the tools to now do the analysis that's required of a value investor. And then um, applying the tools at work, at work in the sense of uh, investing my own money, it becomes a lot more fun to learn in school too. And so I started really investing my own money from 2006 all the way into 2008, 2009, into the financial crisis, out of the financial crisis, and then for the past uh, 10 years since the financial crisis. That's how I got started. Let, let, let's talk a little bit about the financial crisis. Huh? You, 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 you kind, of, kind of just skimmed through it. Like, you, know, you, went through the, you went through the financial crisis mm. like it's uh, no big deal. But uh, yeah. we, we probably started out investing around the same time. I also started around 2006. I remember the financial crisis being a quite a traumatic experience for me. Um, why don't you talk us through as well for you uh, how were you feeling at the time when, when your stock started to crash? And then um, how, how do you basically went through that crisis? Well, maybe I can start a bit before that. 2006, 2007, when everything is going up, whatever I buy goes up. Whatever I buy gets privatized also. I thought I was like really, really great investing. Some of the very good things that I bought and immediately got privatized, including things like uh, Poka Singapore, uh, Sarah Boss, the one that sells the chicken essence. So all these are like one bagger, two bagger within like 10 months, one year. So I thought it was really, really good at investing. So come 2007, 2008, things that I was holding started to go down a bit. I think it was April. And then it goes down a lot more in October. And then next year, it went down even more. The idea of value investing is buying things that are cheap. But I realized that when I don't know the real value of the things I own, and the value declines as the market declines, I can't do value investing well. So for example, one example that I like is uh, my, my experience holding American Express. So I thought American Express, one of the Buffett holding, it must be very safe, one of the biggest credit card company in the world, it's very safe. 
Uh, I did my valuation, I think, in early 2007. And I think the company is worth about $60, $70 per share. It was selling around that amount also. And then the financial crisis started. Prices went down to 40 ish I started buying. Then it went out 30 ish I bought more. And then it went down to 18 I do not know what to do. It went out all the way to 10 I froze. The reason being, I don't know whether American Express will be a going concern during the financial crisis. So that's when I realized I don't know what I'm owning. And I realized I cannot analyze financial firms clearly. So at that time, I didn't do much. I just watched it go down and down and down. And my portfolio is all in red. It's about 70% down from peak to bottom. But I was very lucky that uh, my mom had money lying around. So I did a term loan from her, a, a three-year term loan that will start to mature at the point when I start to graduate, I'll pay her back using my salary. So with her loan, I started buying industrial companies and companies that I know very well. For example, consumer companies. So I think at the depth of the crisis, I bought a lot of Xu Fu Ji. Xu Fu Ji is one of the Chinese candy company that sells this candy called Sha Qi Ma. And no matter how I analyze, Xu Fu Ji is worth about twice to three times the market price. So I bought a lot. I bought so much that one third of my portfolio and one third of my family's portfolio was in Xu Fu Ji. And right after the financial crisis, I think around um, August of 2009, uh, Nestle privatized the whole of Xu Fuji for a very nice price and a huge premium over the price I paid. So then I started being very defensive in all my investment style, knowing that if the financial market is not accommodating, can this company go on? And that became the groundwork of my, all my investment style. So over the, time, over the years, as my ability to analyze improved, a lot of the stocks that I buy are value stocks with potential catalysts. For example, uh, potential privatization candidates. Uh, if there's a REIT, there might be a rights offering that is underpriced and things like that, where there are catalysts around. So one example would be uh, Capital Mall Asia being a spin-off from Capital Land and then going nowhere for a while. But Capital Mall Asia is definitely worth more than the price that it was selling at then. So I was lucky that after a while, Capital Land decided to privatize Capital Mall Asia. Another candidate that I bought that was privatized because the price is just cheap, but I didn't make a lot of it, would be Capital Land. So remember a few years ago, there was the oil crisis. And my expectation is that <clears throat> Capital Group, Capital Corp as a group, will want to stabilize their sources of revenue. And Capital Land has a very good stable source of recurring income from their rental income. So it is a potential candidate to be privatized. So I think we're selling at about half of uh, RNAV. And I thought they would privatize it at one time RNAV. So I'll make like one time my money. Eventually, Capital did privatize Capital Land, but they only privatized at 0.8 or 0.7 RNAV. So I made a bit, but, but it's a very comfortable type of things to own. But you know that even if there's a financial crisis around the corner, it won't go bust. And if there is no financial crisis, it probably will go up. If it doesn't go bust, it doesn't go up, it will also do okay giving you 3 to 8% return. So that, that's how my style of investing has uh, evolved along the way. Right, okay. I, I, I can see that you really give a lot of thought into creating your portfolio. But I, hmm. I wanted to understand also, during the financial crisis, when you say your portfolio dropped about 70 plus, 70 plus percent, hmm. what gives you the confidence or uh, I guess the, maybe the arrogance <laughs> that you think <laughs> that you can recover back the loss? Because a, a lot hmm. of people might at that time just freeze and then panic sell everything and, and say yes. that, you know, I, I will stay away from stock market forever. And this is, mm -hmm. this is not something that is not for me. But how do you overcome that? Or, or, or is it something that never really occurs to you? The, the pain of opening my brokerage account definitely occurred to me where my, my neck would tense up, my hair would stand behind my neck before I click some, uh, uh, a login, right? I think the faith in the value investing method uh, got me through the period. When I look back at my, my losses during that period of time, my inability to average down 
it is due to the fact that not value vesting doesn't work. It's the fact that I couldn't tell what is the actual value or the range of value of certain companies. For example, financial companies under distress. But for certain industrial company, certain consumer goods company, for example, Janssen & Johnson, at the depth of the financial crisis, it was selling at 11 times, a uh, 10 times free cash flow yield, 7 to 10 times free cash flow yield. You look at all three segments of Johnson & Johnson, there is no way all three of them would disappear due to the financial crisis. Its balance sheet is really, really solid. Then, what I should do be buying. Buying things that I understand, buying things that will not go bust, even if the financial crisis is prolonged. And even when I look at things like Shifuji that I mentioned just now, the confidence I get from that is, during that period of time, I was watching uh, TV, CCTV. Oh, Shifuji having promotions on CCTV. I asked my friends in China who are on exchange in Shanghai to go to their, their different supermarket. Shifu is still selling all their candies at the entrance of all the uh, supermarket. So that the goods are really moving. You look at their balance sheet, they have not much debt. You look at the four brothers that run Shifuji, they moved in to work with their workers during the financial crisis. So I cannot imagine a scenario where Shifuji would go bust even if the financial crisis prolonged. And that gave me the confidence to buy a lot of such safe, good, growing company selling at PE of maybe 8 to 12 times, which is not available anytime since the financial crisis, sadly. But, but those gave me confidence. Confidence in the, in the business, confidence in their balance sheet, confidence in the management, and then eventually confidence in the range of valuation that I come up with that I can believe in. Yeah. Wow, okay. It's uh, definitely very insightful. And you talk a little bit, uh, I, I believe that you know your style of investing uh, I can relate to and it's always uh, it's talk basically talking about finding a safe bet first right mm. uh, yes. a, a company that uh, will survive no matter the economic environment uh, out there mm. and when we talk about value investing of course um, most of us will be inspired by Warren Buffett mm. and today interestingly uh, you are going to talk more about his company Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, yes, it is a stock that many value investors would love, and maybe most value investors would 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 own them. Uh, but it is also one of the most complicated business that I have mm. come across. Mm -hmm. uh, doesn't it go against your kind of? Uh, your f philosophy of finding things that are simple and easier to understand. Uh, how, basically, how long did, did you take, take you to fully understand what Berkshire is really about? I think it took me four years to understand what Berkshire is about. I think in 06, 07, during the financial crisis, as you enter the financial crisis, what I did was I printed out every single Berkshire letter all the way to its first letter and started reading in chronological order. So I basically see how it started, how it grew, how it changed over time. I honestly don't understand most of what I'm reading during that, that first year. Then in 2009, I went for the Berkshire Hathaway meeting. That's when I, even though I did not understand the stock well enough, I bought Berkshire B because I wanted to attend the meeting. So I bought like, I think 3K worth of Berkshire B with that little bit of brokerage account I got exchanged for my pass to enter Berkshire Hathaway meeting. And during the meeting and after the meeting, I continued reading and understanding more about Berkshire. I think I gained full confidence in investing in Berkshire in 2013, 2012 and 2013, where I felt like I really understood all the different moving parts of Berkshire and what exactly it means to own Berkshire Hathaway. At first, it might look complicated, it has a lot of moving parts, a lot of subsidiaries. But ultimately, I think I look at Berkshire as a machine. A machine that is so well oiled and so well created that it can't help but compound wealth. And once I understand the machine and how it works, the nitty bitty part about how this particular insurance work, how that particular operating company work, is not that important. It is simply a capital allocation machine is bound to compile wealth over time. And if you can buy this machine at a 
reasonable price, we are bound to compound our wealth at at least the same rate as the underlying return of the machine itself. Wow. Let's dive down a little bit deeper uh, when you talk about how this is a capital allocation machine, right? Mm. So uh, right at the top, why don't you explain a little bit what, what is Berkshire Hathaway? What are we looking at? So a lot of people think of Berkshire Hathaway as Warren Buffett's company. I think the most common uh, wrong impression of people is that they think of Berkshire Hathaway as a portfolio of equities that Buffett picked. It's actually not as simple as that. Yes, the equity portfolio is one part of Berkshire Hathaway and a very important part. But actually, the most important part of Berkshire Hathaway is its insurance business. As an insurance company, we, 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 yes, me own Berkshire, we. <laughs> <laughs> so as an insurance company, we actually receive premiums from our customer to protect them against some future risk. So when we collect the premium upfront, the risk event could be something five years, 10 years, 50 years down the road. Meanwhile, this premium that I've collected is available for me to invest. What do I invest in? I can invest in stocks, in bonds, in cash. And for Berkshire Hathaway's case, they invest in both equities, short-term investments, cash, and also buying whole business. So having this insurance business that generate this premium, Buffett call it float, is one of the most valuable part about Berkshire Hathaway. Because float is essentially a liability, but a liability that not only you don't have to pay off immediately, no one can call on it upfront, so about the financial safety part. What more is if you manage to do right underwriting profit on your float, the underwriting profit of the float is essentially a negative interest cost. So you make money not only by borrowing from your from a customer, you also make money by investing it, you make money through underwriting profitably. So this is two sources of wealth that comes from insurance business. In terms of the moving parts, we can look at Berkshire Hathaway as an insurance business, a, non a group of non-insurance business, and tons of cash, and this super big marketable securities portfolio. And that, that is the four main, three or four main moving parts of Berkshire Hathaway. And once you understand these four moving parts, Actually, Berkshire Hathaway is pretty simple to understand, even though it took me almost a decade. <laughs> Six to eight, ten years, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you describe uh, uh, some of the moving parts of Berkshire, the different parts of Berkshire uh, itself and why it makes it such a beautiful money-making machine. But when you look at it, uh, yes, you say the great thing about Berkshire is because it has this insurance business. But if that's the case, why do you think that other insurance company has not been able to emulate uh, Berkshire and have a similar success of Berkshire? So I think uh, one part of Berkshire's success is Buffett's ability to allow all his uh, insurance companies to not, under, not write policies when the prices are bad. So now imagine you have a room full of employees, the rates are bad. Insurance companies is an insurance business basically is a commodities business. Individual companies cannot dictate the rates. Mm. When the rates are bad, the only sound way to underwrite profitably is to don't underwrite. But if you have a company full of employees, you are the boss. Stanley, would you allow them to just sit around and just drink coffee all day? Probably not. <laughs> yeah, so you ask them to do something, right? And if their job is to underwrite policies, then they will start going out and underwrite policies. Mm -hmm. So what Buffett is quite unique in the sense that he told his uh, managers that if you need, pay them to go play golf. Pay them to go play golf and not to underwrite new policies when the rates are bad. To have that one mindset through and through again and again is actually very hard because most companies crave actions. Mm. And Berkshire Hathaway is one of the businesses, one of the only businesses I've seen where inaction is one of its greatest strengths. Mm. So they only strike when the rates are good. They only buy companies when things are cheap. And most time they read, they sit around, not doing much. Yeah, like like sloth. <laughs> yeah, almost. So uh, very very hard to emulate. Yeah, almost very zen, very zen like. Uh, uh, almost in, <laughs> in the company. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, why don't we go 
into more details of each of the part that you talk about. Um, mm. you, you talk about uh, it's non-insurance control business. Let's, let's dive into that first. Um, what are some of the main non-insurance control businesses? So some of the main non-insurance control business, uh, the biggest one, the biggest two is actually uh, BNSF, which is a railway company. I think it is the largest railway company in United States. So it has the largest railway network it moves goods around, uh, tons and tons of goods. The second biggest company in Berkshire Hathaway's uh, non-insurance control business is the energy business, Berkshire Hathaway Energy. Berkshire Hathaway, and Berkshire Hathaway Energy owns and distributes and create energy for a large part of mid-America. So mid to West America uh, is is mostly supplied, a lot of energy supplied by Berkshire Energy, Berkshire Hathaway Energy. Within Berkshire Hathaway Energy, you have your Home Services of America, which is their uh, home brokerage company. Mm -hmm. So other than that, there is still a lot of industrial companies like Precision Caspart, uh, Marmon Group, Iska. These are all industrial companies that has very niche uh, business. So all of them earn very high return on capital for the other companies. For BNSF and Berkshire Hathaway Energy, these are two regulated business. So they do not earn insane amount of return on capital. They earn enough. But one of the great thing about Berkshire Hathaway is that for BNSF and uh, Berkshire Hathaway Energy, they absorb a lot of capital to make more money. Mm. So this absorption of capital can be a place where Berkshire Hathaway puts their insurance float into so that it earns enough return on the float. Mm. So it absorbs the excess liquidity from Berkshire Hathaway's insurance business. And the other thing is both uh, BNSF and Berkshire Hathaway Energy, these are very capital intensive business. Especially for Berkshire Hathaway Energy, there is a lot of renewable energy that they are doing. When you do renewable energy in the States, you get tax credit for doing green stuff. Mm -hmm. So the tax credit from Berkshire Hathaway Energy for any other utility firm, if it's not under Berkshire Hathaway, will be useless because you won't be paying tax for the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. But for Berkshire, because there's so much profit going on at other parts of business, this tax credit can be used to absorb other part of business. So this Berkshire Hathaway Energy itself simply by the fact that it's owned by Berkshire Hathaway becomes a lot more efficient because the tax credit can be utilized immediately. Right. So let me get this straight. Uh, Berkshire Energy, Berkshire Hathaway Energy, mm -hmm. basically when they say that they're going to build, a, say, a wind farm, you know, they're one yes. of the largest wind farm in the Midwest. So when they build a, a, a wind farm, they will, add, they will have tax credit on their capex. Yes, is, is, and then they can transfer this tax credit to other part of Berkshire Hathaway, or it ha it must stay Apparently within. Apparently, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, that's very interesting. Uh, does is it the same for BNSF as well? So BNSF, uh, they don't get this additional tax credit, mm -hmm. but BNSF, due to simply timing issue of accounting versus tax accounting, mm -hmm. you will see that BNSF because when you are spending a lot of your Capex upfront, your tax depreciation rate could be, so for example, you depreciate your railway in tax life over three years, mm -hmm. but the railway has a 30 year useful life. Mm. So because you depreciate at the tax level faster than at the accounting level, you have this deferred tax liability that appears. So this deferred tax liability sit as a liability on Berkshire Hathaway's uh, consolidated balance sheet but you do not need to pay taxes for a long while. Mm. So that is another way where taxes are moved around, tax benefits are moved around. Okay. Yeah. In the sense, doesn't it uh, mean that, you know, we can expect in the future when Berkshire try and make a full all acquisition, it will be towards more and more capital intensive businesses. So that- Actually that has been the way since uh, mid or early 2000. And that is the reality where Berkshire is so big, it needs to buy things that absorb cash instead of just throw out cash. Mm. Because the insurance business is already throwing out so much cash. 
for example, C's candy doesn't need cash at all. Mm. You only need cash for a few months in the year. And for the rest of the year, you're throwing out cash. But you can't grow C's candy fast. But you can grow a railway company by laying more tracks, doing more cap- capital expenditure fast. And the incremental return on the capital expenditure based on what interview Buffett and Munger has is between 8 to 12%. Mm. 8 to 12% return on incremental capital on a regulated business seems to me a pretty good return on your capital. Yeah. Right. Plus you can borrow. Yeah. Mm. So then the rate might be even slightly higher than that. Right. So basically they are just uh, trying to use it almost like a fixed deposit for their for their f- yep, float. A fixed deposit <laughs> that gives you 10% return, I think that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, fascinating. And let's move on to their second big block of uh, value, which is coming from their collection of equity, right? And, mm. and, and this is the part where most people think of Berkshire when, 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 they're, when they're looking at the company. Um, Berkshire has predominantly been very focused on investing away from tech, but we can see in the recent few years, uh, Buffett himself has been buying uh, Apple and previously he has a failed attempt in buying uh, IBM, his investment. Uh, so how is the collection of equity looking at now and how should investor be looking at this basket of stocks right now? So as of uh, 31st December 2019, that basket of equities is worth about $248 billion. billion. Uh, the cost of this basket of equities is about $110 billion. So they have like $148 billion worth of uh, capital gain, unrealized capital gain on this. So if you look at this group of equities, a lot of them, Buffett do not think of them as pieces of paper that you trade. He typically look at these companies as partial ownership in other businesses. And from that point of view, uh, which is why in a recent CNBC interview, he told uh, Becky that, uh, Buffett told Becky that the la- third largest subsidiary of Berkshire Hathaway is actually Apple. Yeah, because Apple on, on paper is worth like 73 billion, right? Mm. So it's actually the third largest subsidiary of Berkshire Hathaway. So even though he only owns 5.7% of Apple, mm. he looks at it as a subsidiary. Even if they own only, say, uh, 0.6% of Visa, mm. while Visa is still a subsidiary in the sense 0.6%. So the real way to, for an investor to look at um, this group of equities is to go through this idea of look-through earning. From an accounting point of view, earnings are only recognized when it is paid out in dividends. And with the recent tax uh, gap changes in US accounting, even unrealized gain or losses are booked through your P&L. But the way Buffett looks at this would be, if you imagine if you own uh, 5% of Apple, 5% of total Apple earnings, regardless of whether it's distributed as dividend or retained earning, retained as retained earning, are both 5% of Berkshire's earning. So which is why in this year's annual report, you'll see that Buffett actually break down the retained earning portion of all its big, big investment. And what I would do as an investor, I would remove away the unrealized gain that is booked through the gap earning, but add back the retained earning portion that Berkshire actually own is entitled to, but it's not distributed as dividend. Mm. That's how I would say I would look at this group of equities as a group of companies that is retaining earning and working for Buffett without his him working for them. And that's how I would look at all my investments. So in that way, uh, Buffett is my employee. La. Yeah. <laughs> Even though I own just a little bit of Berkshire Hathaway. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I think just from the way he described this collection of equities in his uh, annual letters and also how he constantly talk about uh, owning them as a part ownership of a business uh, really show us how Buffett really thinks about stock investment, right? Yes. But it's, he has been talking about this for almost 50 years of how he <laughs> invests. Why do you think it is a concept that is so hard for general investor to, to grasp? And although we hear this over and over again, but in the stock market, even among value investors, right, we still, uh, I, I still at least meet many investors 
that doesn't think in this way, right? They would still be fearful when their stock prices drop. They will feel still feel very smart when their stock price rallied, regardless of whether that is due to just a multi big, uh, multiple expansion or the company is really earning more. So, in in your own opinion, why do you think this concept is so hard to grasp and to really emulate uh, compared compared to what Buffett is talking about? I think the main reason is it sounds too simple. There is no real arithmetic and, and complex equations behind it. Essentially, it requires a person who is a portfolio manager to think and behave like a businessman. Mm. And I, I just feel that most portfolio managers don't want to put in the effort of a businessman to understand their businesses as well as the businessman would. So imagine if you are you are a small um, owner of a coffee shop. I bet that you would be looking around your estate for any new competitors coming up. If people are having a new promotion, you'll be eager to follow and try to see how to upbeat your, your, your competitor as a business owner. But a lot of people who invest in stocks still see them only as pieces of paper, that quotation that goes up and down. The business ownership of the concept of business ownership through investing, I think, does not naturally attract investors. Mm -hmm. First, it's boring. Then, it's a lot of hard work. And if you can invest, if you can think like a businessman, there is a very high chance that you would be very rich just by running a business <laughs> without running a portfolio. So then, you see there is this, this, this uh, uh, tension between the talent pool. <laughs> If you are that good at business analysis and mm. running business, mm. then you should be a businessman to be very, very rich. Mm. If you are good at analyzing, but you can't take action and don't really know what's the economics of your business, you might end up as a portfolio manager. <laughs> and this portfolio manager, if he does not eat his own cooking, mm. could just be a closeted indexer. Right. And, and that is actually very comfortable and it pays well and it makes you look good in front of your investors, you tweak your balance a bit, and if it goes really wrong, you say, oh, the stock market did not do well this year. You go all the way out, swing into cash, swing back into stock, buy only when it's cheap. I think your it's quite hard to grow at AUM. La. <laughs> it's not very marketable, mm -hmm. this, this concept. It's not very marketable as a, as a public investor. Right. Yeah. So I think it just, that's why value investing will still work because it's hard and there is natural uh, uh, things that block people from behaving that way. Yeah, yeah. that's fascinating insight. Um, in, in my own experience, what I found is uh, many of the business owners that I know, they, they might not make very good investors as well because yeah. many business owners, they are very action orientated mm. and in stock, in stock investing, sometimes, you know, like, like you said, doing nothing might be the best thing. Yes, uh, yes. It, it, uh, and to a businessman, that is very hard to grasp uh, because they constantly need to have some action. <laughs> that's something I found. And, and in, if that's the case, uh, real very good businessmen is already focusing on doing business and uh, more excited in, in running business. And uh, people who are more theory based might prefer investing, but they might not be very good investors. Mm. Uh, in your opinion, which are the subset of people that is ideal to be an investor think, and be successful in it? I think it would be a very, very, very small percent of people who are naturally born with that. I think in terms of uh, understanding value investing, understanding that Investing is most intelligent when it is most business-like. Mm -hmm. And then to even know that when you're running a business, sometimes inaction is also a good action. But very few businessmen does that. Once we are very honest with ourselves that not many of us are wired and trained to be good investors, I think the natural conclusion would be either we index and have a very sound asset allocation policy and I think we'll still do very well in the very long run, very long run. Or we find a few people that you think can do very well, could be fund managers, could be Berkshire Hathaway, could be people you trust like maybe Stanley and follow what they do because you know that 
eh, I'm not possibly, maybe I'm not the one wired to do this well. And, and I always go back to the intelligent investor where Benjamin Graham split up investors into uh, uh, aggressive investors and conservative investors, defensive investors. Mm. I think few of us should be the enterprising investor that go out there to try to beat the market. Mm. It takes a lot, a lot of effort to beat the market. And most of us would fail. But it takes very little effort and very, very high chance, almost certainty that we can beat the market. B, B, E. <laughs> and, and, and just having the market return is good enough for us to retire in a very comfortable way. Why not just do that? So I totally agree with the, the, the idea that most of us should be doing indexing or if we think we can beat the market, either we find the right people to, to back or to follow or we know that we can really do it, then we have to do a lot of work just to get that little bit of incremental return and then see whether it's worth our while to do it, do it mm. full time. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we die. <laughs>